You didn't hear what I said. Thank you to our worship team for that beautiful lead-in to our Festival of Hope. And what a beautiful setting today. It's a bit difficult to stand here and know that uh, dinner is still several hours away. What a, what a beautiful setting. And uh, just to take an ordinary brown food lion grocery bag and make it a decoration in praise to God for our Festival of Hope. What we are doing here today is a God thing. And I'll talk a little more about that as we go along. But today, our second in a four-part series on dining. And certainly, we have the start for it here today. Next week, well, this, the coming week, starting tomorrow, during next week, I will be making a 1,000 mile journey just to have dinner. What? Why would anybody make a 1,000 mile journey just to have dinner? But it's an interesting thing, I'll not be doing that by myself. Other members of the family will be doing it with me, and we will not be doing it just by ourselves because there will be millions upon millions of people making that same journey. Maybe not a thousand miles. Uh, many will be less than that. Many will be more than that. Students will go home from their college study courses to have dinner. Young families will go to grandparents' homes, or grandparents will go to young families' home just to have dinner together. Millions upon millions of people in the most intensely traveled holiday in the calendar of the United States, Thanksgiving Day. It is the focus of time together, and interestingly enough, even in as secular a society as we live now, let us remember that this Thanksgiving event is based upon the graciousness of God and His provision. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. That's who it is we are thanking. The most intensely traveled holiday in the calendar comes up next week. And today we initiate that week of Thanksgiving with our Festival of Hope. But it, it, it initiates way back before our time. It is a God thing about dining together. Uh, in fact, I'm going to trace it for you, and it's going to have to be a rather quick journey through Scripture today because we have things to do. And by the way, at the close of this sermon, it's going to be time for us to bring our offerings for the Festival of Hope. And I know that some of you have left them various places in the back or here in the sanctuary. But the point of it is that we are bringing this Festival of Hope as a God thing. And I'm going to ask you at that point, as the Pathfinders will lead us, and then the rest of you who I see bags sitting here and there in the congregation, what you have brought, go and get it and bring it forward when it comes to that time because it is the culmination of what we are talking about here today. We will instruct you later in that process. But let's look forward to that and focus about God and dining. It actually begins in Genesis, the first chapter. We tend to read through the first chapter of Genesis rather quickly and briefly and bypass some of the implications that are here in this text, Genesis 1, beginning with verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all creatures that move on the ground. <clears throat> so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them. Now here's the interesting thing that comes in this text. God requests three things in the Genesis story. Well, three that are recorded. I don't know how many other things he communicated with that first couple on the face of the earth. But three things God requests that are recorded for us in Scripture. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, the first thing is they're supposed to reproduce and fill the earth in the image of God with their children and grandchildren and on and on. That's the first thing God says. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be <clears throat> yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw what he had made, and it was very good. Now, isn't it interesting that on this first day of awareness, God asks three things of that first couple. Reproduce, rule the earth, and eat. That's what he asks. Now, we can think of all the things God might say. The ones that he chooses, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> to have recorded are just those three. Reproduce, rule the earth, and eat. Think about that a little bit. We tend to just pass by this and go on reading. Think about it. Let's put some kind of a time frame on this. And I don't know exactly how to do it. But let's put some kind of a time frame. What time of day did God create Adam? I don't know. Let's say 8 o'clock. How's that? Seems like a good time to start something in the morning, doesn't it? Let's say he created Adam at 8 o'clock. I mean, let's just get slavishly literal about this thing. How long did it take? I don't know. Give him an hour? Uh, I don't know. Formed him out of the dust of the earth? Okay, by 9 o'clock, Adam is awake. What does he know at that time? Hmm? You're, you're right. You're shaking your head. What does that mean? Nothing? He doesn't know anything. Who does he know at that time? Nobody. He opens his eyes. Who's the first being that he sees? God. He doesn't know him. I don't know what God pre-programmed into his brain. I don't have any idea. But I mean, he opens his eyes. He doesn't know. He has no experience. He knows nobody. He knows nothing. And he meets God. This is kind of stunning, isn't it? Okay, what happens next? Well, as we try to put the story together, it seems the next thing God does is bring the animals by. Apparently, he programmed with the ability to talk and understand because this bringing of the animals by goes on. I don't know. How long does that go, take to, to go by? I mean, all the animals in the earth? I, I'm not sure. Oh, thank you. I, I actually have a bottle of water down there that I didn't bring up with me. Thank you very much. We'll put it right here in case I need it again. He, he brings the animals by, and there's this naming the animals process. Now, how he did that, I don't know. That's pretty amazing. How long does that take? Well, I don't know. Let's give him till 1 o'clock. How's that? I'm, I'm just trying to be literal about this. You know, we just read by this. Yeah, we well, brought animals. And, uh, it, it took some time. He didn't do that in 30 seconds. So he brings the animals by, and there is something that Adam notices when the animals come by. They all have mates. He doesn't. It's a consciousness that he needed to be aware of. That he was not going to be able to multiply and replenish the earth all by himself. So, next thing takes place, some divine surgery. I don't know, how long does that take? Okay, we're, we're at one o'clock in this imaginary time frame. And he causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam and removes a rib. And with God's creative and healing power... Uh, I don't suppose it takes terribly long, but if we gave an hour to create Adam. Let's give an hour to create Eve. I don't know. 
So by 2 o'clock, we have created Eve. Who does she know? Hmm? Nobody. So here she is, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and she meets two people. One is God, and the other one is Adam. Uh, this, by the way, was an arranged marriage. <laughs> I, be, be real about this story, people. Why have we never thought these things through? It's an arranged marriage, and the interesting thing of it is that as the afternoon goes on and she begins to get acquainted with where she's going to live in this garden called Eden with Adam, who she doesn't know, I'm not making this up. I mean, this is, what, this is real. So about late afternoon, somewhere, say, around 5 o'clock, after they've wandered around for a couple of hours, tried to figure out where they're going to live, they're getting hungry. Did you ever think about that? What did they know about cooking? Nothing. What do they know about what to eat? They don't have any recipe books. So God gives them the first recipe book. And he says, these are the things for you to eat. Every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree with fruit in it with seed in it, they will be yours for food. He says, you're getting hungry. Did you know what hungry is? No, we don't know what hungry is. We've never been hungry before. Well, as a matter of fact, we've never been anything before. So somewhere around 5 o'clock, God arranges for Adam to take Eve out for dinner. <laughs> does, this, does this make sense? So what we have here is Eve going out to dinner on a blind date, having just been introduced to Adam a couple hours before by someone that she doesn't know. Now, is this kind of a stunning story, or what? Did you ever think of that? Imagine you open your eyes, and you see a whole world and people in it that you've never seen before, and you don't have any idea how to eat, and somebody takes you out to dinner. Stunning story that God's concern for his people are three things. First thing he says is, I want you to reproduce and fill the earth. The second is, I want you to be in charge of the earth. And the third thing that God says in creation is how to eat. Kind of stunning, isn't it? It's a God thing. And God repeats this over and over again through Scripture, but we come to Genesis 2, verse 16, he tells them what not to eat. Because the power of the meal is so great that the entire history of the earth from then to now hangs on that decision. That's the power of a meal. And unfortunately, they don't listen to him. He says, don't eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Now, I don't know what there was about this tree there are several things that I wonder. I don't know what fruit it was. Well, the traditional fruit is we say it was the apple, don't we? Well, that kind of gives the apple a bad rap. Well, we don't know what it was. Maybe it was mangoes. I don't know. That'd be hard to resist. But the other thing that we don't know is this. We don't know whether that fruit was only available at that spot or whether it actually was available on other trees in other places and the issue was not to go to that tree. We don't know that. Maybe that same fruit was available other places in the garden. We don't know. But what we do know is that it was the power of a meal and a choice that Adam and Eve made as to whether they were going to trust God or whether they were not going to trust him. I don't know how soon that happened. It would seem to me that it probably happened rather quickly. Because if they had followed God's first 
suggestion that they reproduce, it would have been less than a year later that Cain and Abel would have come along. So it would seem to me that it probably happened quite quickly that they doubted God and the serpent tempted them saying God is withholding something from you you don't understand about good and evil come to my tree and I will teach you about evil why would you want to know about evil when all you knew was good and yet the same thing happens over and over again in our lives where there is some draw upon us to find out about evil and the power of the meal was so great that it set in motion from then on the redemptive process but it is interesting to notice how God feeds his people as we go along uh, let's look for a moment when they're in the, the wilderness before Mount Sinai. Uh, the manna. Interesting thing, this stuff called manna. Exodus 16, verse 13. In the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared in the desert. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. That's a translation of the word manna. What is it? That's what they called it. They called it, what is it? And the interesting thing is they never did figure out what it was because they spent 40 years calling it, what is it? <laughs> and we still don't know to this day. And we come down toward the end of that section of Scripture. Verse 31, the people of Israel called the bread manna. Now listen, this is what it, what it was like. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. So the interesting thing was you could eat it raw, kind of like a wheat-thin cracker. I don't know. Like breakfast cereal, corn flakes. I don't know. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omar of manna. That's a quart of what is it. And keep it for generations to come so they can see the bread that I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. But he has given them instructions about how they should do this manna stuff. Gather it in the morning because it melts away. On the sixth day, gather twice as much for each person he said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is the day of rest, the Holy Sabbath. So bake what you will bake and boil what you want to boil. Whatever is left, keep until the morning. So this is a, this is a very unique product. A product that you can eat raw. A product that you can grind up into flour and bake bread out of. A product that you can boil like potatoes. This is God's food, and it tasted like sweet wafers, and they ate it for 40 years and still called it, what is it? It's a God thing. God wants you to eat. Then there's the feast days. Think about all the feast days that God initiated. There's the Passover. Deliverance was a feast day. There was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which occurred at the barley harvest. There was the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost as it was known, which occurred at the wheat harvest. There was the Feast of Tabernacles, which was the ripening of olives and fruit and grapes. There was the Feast of Purim, celebrating the deliverance of Israel in Esther's day. There was the Feast of Dedication, Rejoicing at the restoration of the temple. It's a God thing. God wants you to eat with him and be thankful for what he gives. And he establishes feast days for his people. That's what we're doing this week. That's what we're doing here today. 
the festival of hope. We're doing a God thing. Even the temptation in the wilderness, the devil does not give up easy. He practiced his deceptions in the Garden of Eden, and he uses them in the wilderness on Jesus. When he says, Jesus, who has been fasting, here are stones, turn them into bread that you may eat. But Jesus resists that temptation, not because he does not need to eat, but because he does not use his divinity to serve his own needs. The first miracle, it's a wedding feast. It's a God thing. They gather together at the wedding feast. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we talked about the first four chapters of the Gospel of John. He comes to the wedding feast, and at this feast performs a miracle of providing for an embarrassed host who has run out of drink. It's a God thing. Feeding of the 5,000. This is another interesting story we don't think enough about. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Story of the feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go home to the village and buy themselves some food. They were concerned about people eating, but they said, Oh, get your own food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. What? We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. What's that going to do for 5,000 people? Bring them to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up into heaven. He gave thanks. It's a God thing. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They were all satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. We've never really explored this story quite like we ought to. 5,000 men, it says, plus women and children. Well, I don't know how you would count that. Was there one woman for each man and one child for each pair? I don't know. That would be 15,000, but let's stick with 5,000. He started breaking the bread. Did you ever do the math? Excuse me, I, I do these kinds of crazy things about stories. Did you ever do the math that if you start breaking bread and you break it a piece every second, that's pretty good pace, isn't it? Do you know how long it would take you to give one piece to 5,000 people? It would take you an hour and a half. Something else is going on here. There's more to this story than we can imagine. This food just seems to be erupting out of the hands of the Lord. Because I do not believe that he took an hour and a half, or if there were 15,000, that'd be four and a half hours. I don't believe that happened. Food is just arising out of nowhere. Kind of like is going to happen here today. Food just showing up for the festival of hope. It's a God thing. What, what, what did he break? What, well, he had bread and fish. Is that the only thing that showed up? I don't know. This is kind of wild. But I mean, if you're going to have a miracle where food is just erupting out of his hands and out of the ground... Maybe some other food showed up, too. I don't know. I mean, it's a miracle, isn't it? Maybe some pomegranates showed up. Or how about some dates, fruits that they were acquainted with? Grapes? Maybe lettuce and tomato sandwiches? I, I don't know. Was it only bread and fish that showed up? Well, if you're more comfortable with that, fine. 
But when God called on his people here today, more than bread and fish has showed up. And if God can perform that kind of miracle now, he could perform that kind of miracle then. It's a God thing. The miracle of providing food. God wants you to eat. He wants to eat with you. Then there's the Lord's Supper. Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this supper with you to his disciples. Earnestly desired this supper. And as he breaks the bread for them, the interesting thing is what is taking place. Did it ever occur to you that when Jesus broke the bread with his disciples, it was not the last supper. It was the first supper. Because it was the first of a new thing that he had done, he was reversing the curse that occurred from eating of the tree in the Garden of Eden. He gave to Adam and Eve the bounties of life, and it was taken away from them when they ate from the wrong tree. And in the upper room, he reverses that curse and gives in that first supper a meal that all of his church shall partake of down through the ages until finally they reach the place where he totally restores it all in his kingdom. But one more interesting story. Interesting story of Jesus feeding his disciples. In fact, it's related to the one that we did last week. Remember the, the road to Emmaus? They didn't recognize Jesus until he served supper. Okay, here's another one. This one is in John, the 21st chapter. Starts in verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. Oh, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like the Emmaus story that we talked about last week. They don't know him. He's resurrected. They don't recognize him. What do you expect a resurrected person to look like? Someone all beat up? We talked about that last week. No, he's resurrected. He's glorified. He's in a resurrected body. He called out to them, Friends, have you any fish? which it would be a common thing to do for someone standing on the shore, for people who have toiled fishing at night and who are expecting to sell them. Friends, do you have any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. That's kind of crazy. I mean, there's no fish on the left side of the boat and there's some on the right side. What? We have right-handed fish here? What? What is this? When they did so, they were unable to haul in the net with the fish. Skipping down through the story, Jesus said to them, bring, well, I'm going to go ahead, skip too far. Verse 8, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, and they were not far away from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. Well, here's the fish and the bread thing again. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. He's resurrected. He's ascended to his father, and he shows up by the Lake of Galilee to have breakfast of fish and bread with his disciples. He wants to eat with you. It's a God thing. They knew it was the Lord. They did not dare ask, who are you? Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. It's a God thing. He wants to eat with you. He wants to meet with his church, with his people. Revelation, the third chapter. Verse 21, verse 19, sorry. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will go in 
and eat with him and he with me. It's a God thing. He wants to eat with you. He wants to share his bounties and he wants you to share in a godly act with others. It's a God thing. But we finally come to the end of it all. We come to the book of Revelation. 19th chapter, verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. You're invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's a God thing. Here's how Ellen White describes it. I love this. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and went to the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done my will, suffered for me. Come to the supper, for I will gird myself and serve you. We shouted, Alleluia, glory, and entered into the city. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna. I mean, he's even got, what is it there? <laughs> Almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. Oh, dear people, it's a God thing. He invites you to eat with him. He wants to restore what was lost in the Garden of Eden. He wants to fully restore what was initiated at the First Supper. And he wants you to join him in his kingdom and share at that silver table miles in length when he girds himself and serves you. Because from the day of creation to the day of redemption, it's a God thing. Today we have come to share the bounties that God has blessed us with, to share them with those who at this season may not have the kind of bounties that we enjoy. Our pathfinders are with us here to initiate the bringing of these special gifts. But I know that you in the audience, or maybe you left them other places in the room, also have things to share because as you bring them forward today you are doing so in the image of God it's a God thing <laughs>